All right, folks, we are getting into game number one in a best of three, and these guys are about as off-race as off-race gets. In the bottom left side of the map, normally Terran, but currently Protoss, it's Beastie Cutie. And it's top right as the red Protoss, he is Hydra. So we did ask before the game, um, Hydra didn't reply, but Beastie said his off-race isn't too bad. He actually apparently got Grandmaster off-racing last season. So that's something recent as well, not saying like, oh, I got Grandmaster off race like in Hots. Uh, but he does say that he's not confident that he could ever beat Hydra Zerg, though, no matter what the race determination is. <laughs> so uh, I think this, incoming transmission. Uh, this series is a lot less about getting a good race for Beastie and just a lot more about hoping Hydra doesn't get Zerg. Yeah, I guess. I mean, that's <laughs> it's much better than just hoping that Hydra doesn't roach Ravager all in you, I guess. Actually getting an off race. Yeah. That's better hope. Uh, Five dollars coming in real quick out of JTDC. He says nerf Protoss, DT's OP, even versus Protoss. Uh, that's actually twenty something dollars I need to go update the jars with. I forgot. But uh, what's cool about this map order, guys, is if this goes to game three, we'll have pre on terraces. And if we do, um, due to the nature of the new map intro that you haven't seen yet, there's going to be part two giveaways in chat. You <laughs> will understand the stupidity of why when we get there. <laughs> now, um, for BC, okay, maybe his Protoss is good. But here's the thing about Hydra, and this is where I'm... This is almost like a little bit of StarCraft racist for a moment. Every Korean we've talked to, for the most part, is actually good at the other races. And at some point in their career, the tournament winners, the guys like Hydra, the Kespa players, etc., they actually practice the off races just so they could understand them from a different point of view for their main race. This is not mm -hmm. something I'm making up. This is something we've learned talking to players over time. Not everyone does this, of course, but my money says Hydra has probably had a good amount of practice as Protoss, and I don't imagine this will be the messiest thing for him. Not to mention, Hydra is just innately good at StarCraft. Even if he had never played a game of Protoss in his life, I'm pretty sure he could pull off a build or two. Yeah. Well, that was... a. Uh... And it's actually what made Savior so good until all the, uh, well, you know, match fixing scandals and whatnot, uh, was that he uh, confirmed, like, that's why his UVT was so good, because he was actually, like, a really, really, really good Terran as well as Fantastic Zerg. So it's been that way for a long time, and certainly I think Hydra's Kespa training has so followed him to America. Talk a little bit about that, actually, with Fear Dragon uh, last night, with just how Hydra was one of those guys that, like, he seems to have done really well moving to America and being on a foreign team. Whereas, like, you know, Violet and Paul are doing okay. I think they would have done, you know, the same amount no matter what. Hydra has just become this a very adaptive, better Zerg all around for, like, big <laughs> tournaments. I know, adaptive. Um, <laughs> uh, and uh, I think that will actually help in a random versus random tournaments, regardless if he actually plays Protoss a whole lot. I'm sure he actually uh, looks at it. I mean, I'm pretty sure everyone, well, no one's saying it. Everyone's thinking, like, well, Scarlet could win an MLG game off raising <laughs> extra hydra. Okay, too, right? okay. But give her Terran in that game, and then what happens, all right? Exactly. I'm just saying, like, that's what I love about this. Some people are going to be terrible with one race, maybe good with another. <laughs> there is there is this element of gambling, and there's no re-gaming. You don't be like, okay, well, you know, I did get the race I wanted, so I'm, uh, I'm lagging. Can we restart? Like, no, it's... You gotta stick with what you got. Uh, now it is Stargate openers on both sides, and the Oracle for Hydra's coming across the map. But as we see out of Beastie, you know he went uh, Feather Phoenix real quick. He's good to go. There's no Oracle cheese that's gonna work on him, or rather, shouldn't work on him. Are we going to have Phoenix Wars? No, Beastie would win it so I hard. Think it would be hilarious to have Phoenix Wars with two players who don't normally do Phoenix Wars because that is actually a fight that, while it doesn't look like it requires a lot of precision, actually does. Oh yeah, for uh, sure. I hate I, I hate this reference because a lot of people don't take it seriously, but in Control <gasps> and Rotterdam has shown us some of the coolest Phoenix Wars of any Phoenix Wars we've ever seen. Triple Stargate Phoenix? That's too much. Yo. Stop! Stop! Stop the Stargates! Both of you! <laughs> you're like... This is like Cold War status. You're just like bulking up the nukes, but in this case you're bulking up the Stargates. <laughs> Unsure if you're ever really gonna fight, you just gotta be ready to, you know? There's no way Hydra wins this. His Stargates are too late. Like, he has to transfer over into either like the range upgrade and then hope to god he actually has the ability to use the range upgrade. Okay, well he's not going to. Beast is gonna feed him to that one too. 
Or he's going to have to like transfer out into a ground. Or I but, just hope that Mother's Core really works. So here's what's so dumb about the Phoenix Range upgrade, though. And this is and even the weapon upgrades. For those who've never seen this come down, uh, the Phoenix Range upgrade only matters if you start off outside of range. The problem is you're never actually going to pull away and gain range or anything like that over your opponent at any given point. Because the idea is that the Phoenix match each other in speed. So if, if, if Hydra starts off out of range and runs away, he's going to stay out of range. That's not going to change. The weapon upgrade also doesn't come into effect until I think it's like plus three or something. I don't actually remember the exact dynamic of this. But due to the fact that Phoenix do so much damage to other Phoenix, they have, they have got this real glass cannon effect. We already do a maximum amount. Having those upgrades will not be super beneficial. Obviously, it will be beneficial. But it won't be critically uh, important until you're like maxed out. So this is... Uh, I'm trying to remember, I think it was Rotterdam who did this, and I'm, oh gosh, can I get the map right? It was uh, Vane Research Station, I believe, where mm -hmm. he was down in Phoenixes, and we all know Phoenix versus Phoenix is just like Muta versus Muta. If you've got less, you lose. But he hallucinated several Phoenix, and which ended up allowing him to take the lead and end up winning the Phoenix War. And I still remember that because it was the only time we've ever seen any, no pro even pulled that off, and it was the coolest tactic. And it was the only way we've seen anyone pull up from being behind in Phoenix. Mm-hmm. There are certainly some cool tricks, but we'll see if it actually plays a part here. At the end of the day, the CQD has had the faster, like, start on the Phoenix Wars. Now, the Phoenix actually caught up. Hydra getting a faster third is almost like the Muta vs. Muta Wars. Like, you get the faster gas, hopefully you can produce a little bit more. And, of course, the CQD invested into the range and the plus one upgrade. So that has allowed the Phoenix count to even up just about. But if BC Cutie gets that range upgrade locked on a Hydra and does it correctly, of course, then he'll be good to go. And I don't know if he realizes that, of course, because it's like like flappy wings versus flappy wings. Can't really tell. And oh, well, the range doesn't even matter. <laughs> yeah, this is what we're talking about. If you start off in range, it's fine. As he pulls away, he eats a couple of extra shots, but that's where you bait him back over the photon overcharges, which are going to trump any amount of Phoenix damage, at least for now. It's still 13 versus 14. And as Phoenix spread out, that's where you can sometimes get a bit of an edge. The engagement path is a lot more acceptable for BC than it is for Hydra, but both players there we go. gotta be very careful about go. this. BC actually is taking advantage of that range. How yeah. is not performing too poorly through this? It's so dumb. This is so dumb. Uh, BC <laughs> Cutie is continuing on his upgrades to plus grub. two. So dumb is why we made this tournament, all right? So dumb is exactly what we were hoping for. Out of <laughs> so random, not so dumb. Uh, the stalkers on the ground are helping a surprising amount, but still not enough. Now Hydra is down by seven phoenixes. That's, uh, I think, Mother's Core's last. Yeah, last cannon for another... 20 or so seconds, and she's actually uh, a little vulnerable. Yeah, if Pochon Overcharge goes down, could pick her off right there, right now. Right, go, 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 go. Oh, that's a good snipe. This is actually pretty bad now for Hydra. Even though Stalkers are coming on the ground, they're very ineffective versus Phoenix. And in fact, as we see, just zoning out his opponent's own Phoenix allows him to get to that middle line. Gonna pick up these Stalkers, couldn't give less of a fuck because he's got 18 Phoenix to one, and I think BC <laughs> just won this game. I think so. This is... <laughs> This, the stalker count, it's going to chip off temporarily, but uh, there's more Phoenix where that came from. He's still producing back at home behind this, and BC's even taking a fourth. Just mass cannons. It's He's a mineral Hydra. 17 army supply. <laughs> well, like I said, we wanted stupid games. We got him. Yeah. GG!